Thank you. Welcome, uh, Mrs. Sickens, if you'd like to state your name for the record <laughs> and proceed. Ingrid Sickens, I live on Vaughn Road, and we own the land that is across the road from this facility. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Thank you for your work. Um, I have this quote from the Township of West Lincoln, will be a community that values our heritage, preserves our environment and natural resources, fosters entrepreneurial spirit and provides excellent quality of life. Let's remember that last statement, excellent quality of life. Mr. Shea Gore Gayo wishes to use one of the existing outbuildings located 50 meters from the road in addition to the proposed 15 hoop houses and a future warehouse <coughs> totaling 10,200 square meters. The existing outbuilding does not meet the 150 minimum setback uh, required for medical marijuana production as required by the township zoning bylaw, although this was clarified today. The applicants have proposed that the issue of odor will be addressed through the installation of charcoal filters on the hoop houses which will vent the greenhouses. Hoop houses ventilate in hot weather mainly by rolling up the sides along the length of the greenhouse. These hoop houses, I've worked in them previously, they get extremely hot in the summer. Uh, by the middle of May you already have to roll up the sides so I'd like to see if there is any greenhouses that have this HVAC that are hoop houses and um, that they can control the air coming out of there because they do get very hot. It has been de documented in the email from the township that hoop houses can be vented with a negative pressure. Research needs to be done to see how the setup works in a marijuana production facility. Currently there is a greenhouse operating in Pelham that has begun in production in October 2017. The Voice of Pelham, the local paper, reported this past week that pot odor leaves some residents fuming. It can be smelt at times one and a half kilometers away. And they have been using the high quality carbon filters and this has not solved the odor problem. I can't imagine what it will <coughs> smell like in the summer uh, with the sun bringing the odor to a higher level. No one will be able to have their windows open, no barbecues, no pool parties and, or other outdoor activities. Remember, excellent quality of life. Though marijuana production is indeed regulated at the federal level, for citizen complaints related to odor, they would have to contact the respective municipality. Additionally, the Ontario Ministry of Environment and Climate Change makes it clear that odor falls under the town's jurisdiction. The Ontario Municipal Act gives municipalities the authority to regulate nuisance odors. Municipalities also have bylaws that govern zoning, operational permits, licenses, and waste handling, which may be a, so a source of odor. Section 129A of the Municipal Act allows municipalities to prohibit and regulate with respect to odor. A Health Canada guidance document asserts those areas within a site where cannabis is present must be equipped with a system that filters air to prevent the escape of odors and of present pollen. Guidance documents do not carry the force of the law. This means that once a marijuana operation is ejecting <coughs> an awful odor, there is nothing legally in place that will require the owners to correct the problem. Who will ensure that the filters are working correctly and are changed periodically? The four ill people who live in the home? Remember, they have to take care of all the plants as well. In Kelowna, BC, it has a bylaw that prohibits the manufacture, growing, storage, transfer, or disposal of a substance that admits odors, fumes, or particulate matter that destroys the environment, comfort, and convenience of the individuals. I think the town needs to pass a bylaw like Kelowna. Now let us consider how much marijuana can be produced in 15 hoop houses. If each plant can be as tall as a person, and Mr. Gayo has a license to grow 976 plants, 
I cannot honestly believe that these four ill people will need this volume of marijuana to treat their illness. The amount of marijuana that is produced in 50 houses for these four sick people is far too much for them to use. It will either make them sicker or put them in the grave. Why so much? I think this is for an illicit business on the side. The reduced setback <coughs> between the existing accessory structure and the parcel to the east does not increase the need for mitigation since it appears the parcel has little or any development potential. The parcel to the east has potential. It's been produced, it has been purchased by a young entrepreneur that has an excavating business that can develop this property into something useful, perhaps to expand the hamlet of Vaughan. This proposed fa fa facility is within meters of the hamlet of Vaughan and it shares a fence line. A number of young families have built homes here in the past year. West Lincoln has been growing in the hamlets as well as in Smithville. Remember that line from the West Lincoln Township? Excellent quality of life. Or is that only for some people? In addition to the fence <coughs> required by Township bylaw, the strong locks required by Health Canada, the applicant is proposing to install an alarm system with cameras around the perimeter of the buildings, the barn door, the safes, and the front entrance. This did not happen last summer when it was grown illegally. There was no one on the property. The doors were wide open. Remember, there will be four ill people taking care of the property. The township's vision of continued viability of agriculture on prime agricultural land is not offended because the impact on existing and potential agricultural operations is minimal. The past year, the owner has not been diligent in maintaining the property and has grown 50 acres of flea bane. A resolution <coughs> is at so Ontario Soil and Crop Association, Association meeting this week in order to classify this <coughs> weed as noxious. This weed can germinate at below zero and has thousands of seed per plant. Might I, might I suggest that Township is not offended because they do not farm beside a neighbor such as this. The owner has only cut the, land, the lawn when it was directed to by Township. A zoning amendment is required to permit the med medical marijuana production facility greenhouse on the subject property and the minimum setback of 150 meters from all lot lines and all other lots must be reduced to 45 meters from the existing approximate 245 square meter accessory building to the lot line on the parcel to the east. I can't imagine what it will be like to live across the road on the downwind side of that facility in the summer of 2019 where Mr. Sullivan lives. Do, please do not change the setback for the distance. Please remember <coughs> excellent quality of life. Thank you, Mrs. Sickens. I'm looking to others who wish to address committee at this time. I'm going to ask one more time, are there any other members of the public wishing to address committee at this time? <clears throat> Seeing none, uh, members of committee, I'm going to confine the discussion to this table, and it's now the appropriate time for members of committee to... I gotcha. I think I'm going to have to have a speaker's list, is what I was thinking. So I have this whole book. <laughs> Councillor Bell and Councillor Bilesma, and, and... How about I just go this way? Sure. Would that bother anybody? And then I'm sure that we'll do it a couple times. So, Ganan, I think... Okay. We'll mix it up next time. Councillor Bell, I saw your hand first, so please. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, I've got a few questions I'd like to ask. And I, I guess the first one is, uh, I, I read on page 171, uh, it's unfortunate Mr. Rivers isn't here to answer some of these. But I understand. Best. Other members of committee have been concerned, have made their concerns yeah. known to me already at the break so, about the fact that the planner is not here tonight. So okay. when we'll you're, if I could ask members of committee, when they're referring to pages, can you refer to the agenda page at the bottom yes. so that we can all get to the same place? Yep, yeah, they're all there. Thank you. So it's proposed use of, now includes a maximum 
buildout of 15 greenhouses with approximately 10,000 plus square meters of buildings. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to go back. This is all new, and as I said back in November meeting, the truth is yet to come out as late as right up until this afternoon. Uh, the lawyer representing this client has come forward more information, so we really don't have all the newest of information. Unfortunately, I'm not sure when and if we're ever going to get it. Uh, my second one is page 172 under the designated grower provisions. Uh, it says right there that Health Canada requires that the grower observes all provincial regional and local bylaws. Uh, it's been proven that he hasn't done that up till now. And just not sure that the owner could follow the rules. And it's very difficult to trust an individual that has had so many things go wrong for him and the truce that he hasn't followed. And he's tried to deceive the township and the residents. Uh, I, I go on to page uh, 175, and a registered, registered or a designated person is responsible for taking all necessary measures to ensure the security. Uh, you know, they talk about stronger locks, installing home monitor alarms. Uh, they go on to talk about individuals who are registered with Health Canada produce a limited amount of medical marijuana, uh, expected to obey, and, and the key words expected, <coughs> as was shown earlier, they, they don't obey the rules and the regulations. Uh, we've seen how that works with the owners. Uh, we, we also talk about the applicants have indicated that they will reapply for these licenses on the subject property once the zoning approval is obtained. The truth is, you know, do we want this kind of business in our community? And I think we've heard from the residents quite loud and clear that we really don't. And then I move on to page 176. And it talks about in addition to the updates provided in this report, uh, justification, uh, the applicant's wishes to use one of the existing buildings. That was addressed tonight saying that it wasn't going to be used at this time was the words. Uh, it will have consideration down the road. So, you know, would this request be made? No one clearly, uh, your ask does not meet the minimum requirements. Even down the road, it's not gonna meet the requirements, so. And then I move into some of the letters at uh, page 183. Uh, we, we get into the letters from the residents. There's been a lot of good points made. Uh, they ask a lot of great questions, and I, I really don't believe that they've been answered for them. Uh, how will the facility be overseen? As to the compliance, they talked about security, but later on you'll see how that security is going to work. Uh, there, there's numerous letters, page 185. They talk about security, smell, policing, community safety should all be given priority. And as we know, we live in a rural area. Living in a rural area, police response is as quick as they can get here. It's not the big city. There's not a police cruiser sitting on every other corner. So that that is a major concern to us. And I know they say they're going to monitor everything. Uh, I go down to page 187, and he talks about how the owner is quite confident that he would appreciate that our country or township does not allow harm to be imposed on all the citizens and that <clears throat> he would be open to move into another property. I'm, I'm sure he would be open to it and I'm not sure why he lives in the Toronto area, why he wouldn't want to have his business in his community where he's available to it. And I've asked myself that, and I asked that at the last meeting also. Uh, why would he come to another community to cause harm? Not sure. Never did get an answer for that. Uh, 188, the question was asked um, <clears throat> from the resident, is this how he behaves now? Imagine how he will uh, run his marijuana business. 
I suspect his integrity will uh, be very low if he has any. Um, again, he did grow and he got caught. When asked about it, he denied it. Uh, it was proven clearly that they were growing illegally on the property. Uh, my understanding, when you grow marijuana in a house, and apparently he was grown in the house, that house now can't be sold. It has to be torn down because of that. Uh, would that be correct, Mr. Trouble? Sorry? Through you, Madam Chair. Through you, Madam Chair, I'd have to investigate to find an answer to that by talking to the CBO and the fire chief. I, I'm not I'm not able to answer that question tonight. I, I believe so because of the mildew problems it causes with the humidity. Certainly with the intensity, yeah. it, it would. Yeah, so anyway, uh, page 190. Um, <coughs> excuse me. They talk about licensed... Uh, Producers and how they're required to comply with all the requirements under the uh, ACMPR. Uh, this includes Section 61, which requires the areas within the site where the cannabis is pr present and must be equipped with a system that filters air to prevent the escape of odors. We've heard from the HVAC, HVAC representative, and, and I agree with the residents. I don't know, I'm asking, do you have? the system in hoop greenhouses now that we if, could look if, at if it is your you, intent Chair. to ask that question this would be the appropriate time I'm, I'm to asking. uh ask yes uh mr buford buford sorry uh, not in i have to ask you to come to the podium because we're taping this Yes, uh, these systems are not currently used in hoop houses. They are currently used in the warehouses that are being operated at this time. Okay, so through you, Madam Chair, why are they not used in hoop houses? Uh, to my understanding, nobody actually uses carbon filtration in hoop houses. It's uh, something they've just been venting to the atmosphere, and this is something I believe that the client is uh, trying to go above and beyond to try and help the community out with odor concerns. Okay, so, yeah, I, I'm gathering that is your answer. And they, nobody's ever asked to use them, but he wants to use them, and you believe they will work. They are where, being used in warehouses where they do work. It is but, the accepted yes. practice within the field. But it's not proven to the same degree as these are used in houses, as HEPA filtration, they're used in hospitals, they're used in chemical factories. It's more than just a hoop house application. It's actually something that's just meant to control order. Okay. So through you, Madam Chair, do you have any data that would back that up to say that they will work in a hoop house? Uh, in or terms of does active carbon filter odor, yes. So I'm not asking that. I'm asking will this system work in a hoop house? Do you have any information or data that backs that or supports that? Other I, than you saying you believe, yes, it should work. Uh, in that case, I cannot say yes for sure. It will work in every application it is applied in. It is the best method of having an effective use of odor control at this time. Okay. There are other products in development that don't, aren't market available yet, like okay. biofilters. So carbon filter is the only set way to control so odor. So you really can't support the fact that they would work other than you believe they would work? Uh, well, under this premise, it is the proven method of controlling odor in any field, um, whether it be involving a okay. marijuana smell or a chemical smell. Uh, carbon filters do, in fact, filter odor but through no. absorption. No. That's so will it work? Yes. To what degree? So can you I show me? It should be sufficient. Can you show me? In terms I'm, I'm looking for data to say this carbon system is going to work in a hoop house? Well, scientifically, it can be shown that okay. the adequate CFM to create so, a negative draft okay. is adequate and that the carbon filters do filter odor. Okay, so in other words, you don't have that information saying that they are going to work in a hoop house? Uh, it could be provided scientifically. It is not in practice at this point in time. Okay, so okay, that's all for that. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm sure we'll be asking to come up again, so don't yeah, leave your seat. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, 
198 would be the next one. I just got to get there. <clears throat> this was a planning review uh, done by our planning department uh, dated July 12th, 2017 in regards to 1374 Port Davison Road. Right. And there's just, I guess, a couple of questions for Mr. Treble. Uh, number five in number seven, uh, halfway through number seven, it says, however, should any proposed buildings be <clears throat> used for the house, used to house any operation related to the process and such as cutting, packaging, preparation for distribution, of the product other than the raw crop, uh, the building will be considered to be used as an industrial use and thus this is required to satisfy the different and distinct requirements of the Ontario Building Code. So right now and what they're asking for, will this fall under that requirement of the Building Code because they are going to be well, they got to cut it and package it somehow. Through you, Madam Chair, it would be my understanding that there is going to be a growing component, which is most of these hooped structures, mm -hmm. and that there is an additional component, I think it's on the site plan to the south part of the property, uh, where potential uh, processing could occur, mm -hmm. and the, the purple box at the bottom. So my thought, based on what I'm reading in Jeff's comments, is that the, the, the purple area, the, the processing area, would be subject to the industrial provisions as, okay. as he's alluding to there. Okay, thank you. Uh, 203, and I'll get there. <clears throat> Down near the bottom, it, it, and I agree with what some of the residents have said, it, it refers to the number of plants permitted. 244 plants per patient. Uh, there's four patients total, that's 976 plants. And yet, <clears throat> you know, we've heard the numbers, <clears throat> excuse me, you need 37 square feet for 1,000 plants when they're seedlings. <clears throat> 15 greenhouses is pretty excessive for four patients. Uh, there's no justification for it. <clears throat> excuse me. Did you want to hear a justification? If they can, you? by all means. I don't. I noted that they didn't have a crop no. specialist or a grower here either that could answer the agricultural right, question. Yeah. So we might be beyond our depth. Yeah. Well, Madam Chair, I'll say a few words about the uh, spacing, if I may. Yeah, but as a non-expert in the in the growing of plants, please come forward if you want to add to it. Sure. Uh, well, perhaps I mean Mr. Lloyd might be closer to an expert. In this uh, in cultivation, marijuana cultivation. So perhaps I'll have to address these things. This is not horseshoe. So, Mr. Lloyd, if you'd like to tell us your, your credentials on, on the growing of marijuana, I know you're a lawyer and you are also something else. Um, Mr. Lewin has told us that you will also do something else. But uh, you, do you grow marijuana? Uh, I edit books about cannabis cultivation ah. for the last 10 years. Um, okay. It's so a bit for the like record, a school question. So for the record, you are not a grower. I'm not a cannabis cultivator. Okay. Uh, I think the, the main issue is, uh, as um, Councillor Bells uh, indicated, is heat buildup in the hoop house, which is minimized by the, uh, the minimized number of plants per greenhouse uh, that's causing some concern. So it's a bit, it's, it's difficult to uh, satisfy all of the ranges of concerns here. But... Uh, in regards to odor, uh, there would be four 7,200 cubic feet per minute exhaust fans uh, filtering the air, which would create negative air pressure. So in the event that the flaps are rolled down to a certain extent to bring in fresh air, uh, there's still that negative air pressure to deal with A, the heat buildup. B, uh, the heat buildup is uh, much worse if you have a high, high concentration of plants in there. If you have uh, a small number of flowering plants, say 69 within that space, uh, ultimately the heat buildup issue is minimized. And I think uh, it's very difficult. So I guess um, that's why there's that lower plant number. There's more space around the plant. There's less heat buildup and less odor issues. 
but again, that raises concerns from uh, Councillor Bell, which um, I, I can only assuage so many concerns. But as far as a response to that, that's ultimately the reason uh, is to to manage the. So you need issues. more greenhouses. If I can sum it up, you need more greenhouses if you don't want to over if you don't want to have hot heat. That's so right. that's why you're suggesting we need 15 greenhouses because you need more space so there's not as much that heat. That solves the odor issue and it solves the heat buildup issue. So if you concentrate it in just the one greenhouse, then you would have a, an exacerbated odor issue uh, and an exacerbated heat issue, which uh, in turn would exacerbate the odor issue because the flaps would be rolled up. So You, you didn't answer Councillor Bell's point, Sorry. though. There was one about you could grow a lot more plants if you weren't so, you know, you could fit a lot more plants in each greenhouse. Right, but you would be in violation of your license. I don't think that was his question. Oh, I'm sorry. You could you could possibly grow a lot more plants in the in the space within that greenhouse. Is that correct? I believe that was his question. Yes, yeah. you could. Sorry, I should sure. have been more clear. You could. Okay. okay. Ca Councillor Bell so, still has the floor. Yeah. I apologize, Councillor. Yeah, sorry, I was just I trying to get a got a lot of questions. So, through you, Madam Chair, you you raised another point. You said flaps rolled down what do you mean by that if you have a hoop greenhouse are you rolling up the sides of the plastic to let the air circulate uh, they have uh, passive air intake on the roof yeah. of the the John Bower greenhouses I believe uh, from uh, when I had the information from my report and then on the sides so the exhaust are on the two uh, the front and the back and then along the sides are the intakes um, and so by creating negative air pressure inside, it draws air through those flaps, which can be opened and closed. So which is letting the inside atmosphere escape to the outside? Uh, yes, if you don't have exhaust fans. Okay. So that's why they put the exhaust fans on. And, and there are, uh, these greenhouses do already have the 36 by 36 uh, exhaust ports. So they're designed to have an exhaust fan hooked on there or an intake fan. Uh, but because of the odor issue, they're doing uh, four exhaust fans that are filtered. So uh, that's the effort to deal with the odor issue, which uh, appears to be a main cause of concern for neighbors. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next one is 204, process of the facilities. Uh, <clears throat> talks about the greenhouses, total gross floor area, large because of the applicant does not want the plants too close together keeping the plants spread out uh, it was addressed just a second ago touched on it talks about uh, mother plants first state second state seedlings colognes uh, it's really not our problem you know they got a license for 944 plants or something of that nature he was 46. 46. How, how they do it is up there. It's not 15 greenhouses to spread this out. No. I, I have a problem with that one. Um, you got page uh, 205. Um, there, there's different things they talk about. Uh, initially, uh, an existing accessory building, the existing barn, it was used... For, for horses and stuff. Uh, now they're going to have uh, uh, enhanced security measures on the subject property, which will be used uh, to store some of the stuff. Now that was addressed tonight, saying they're going to build a warehouse instead of using the barn. So I'm okay with that, but they want to bring it back in the future. So it's kind of still on the table. It's only been pulled off for the purpose of this meeting tonight. It's never disappeared. So it's still out there. Um, the destruction of the waste products, I mean, it just says they're going to cut it down, bag it, and take it over to the local dump. Like, really? <laughs> that's, that's your answer to get rid of it? Um, I think there has to be a better disposal system. You go, sorry, you're going to mix it with kitty litter so it can't be used. That's not a good system. There, there has to be a better disposable system in place for sure. Uh, they, they, you know, I have a concern about water and drainage. How, how does that, how are you going to water the plants and where is the excess water going to go to? 
how you're going to get rid of it. You know, there's no provisions for, for holding tanks or anything. It's going to run off into the ditches, you know, and, and I, again, that needs to be addressed. We really don't need that byproduct in our ditches in our community. Uh, I go down to 211 and just give me a minute to get there. 10, 11. I'm going to skip 211 and I'll come back to that one. Uh, I'll go to the 214 security. Uh, Excuse me. Talks about the security. It says here like property value, security is not a land use planning issue a new bank or other similar businesses or a Jingsai farm are not expected to provide security uh, information as part of the planning justification. But it's our bylaw and it's in our bylaw. We, we wanted security on that property and, and Mr. Rivers is saying it's really not part of the planning process. And I know they've addressed it in here saying this is what they're going to have. But just to have that comment in there is just, you know, shouldn't be there. 215, um, the licensed patients will reside in the single detached dwelling on the subject property. They will monitor the cameras. And there's a couple of things. One is for Mr. Trouble. Um, you know, you're going to have not a family living in the home, but various people living in the home. It's really no more than a flop house. So, you know, I, I don't believe they're legal in our community, flop houses. Is there a license they can get for one? Multi-residential homes, Mr. Treble. Well, it's, yeah, okay, you're being nice. <clears throat> the, uh, the township uh, planning staff here have uh, been inquiring with uh, legal counsel for the applicant to get some better understanding of what the living arrangements will be. Um, as I think we all will understand, the definition of family is certainly not a traditional definition. Um, so there is, is a lot of gray area in there, but I've you know been asking questions in terms of whether this is some sort of a boarding or lodging house or exactly what this is. So staff will seek to get that clarified as part of any recommendation report that comes forward. Thank you. And, you know, unless I've read this wrong, but it, it, it says that the residents that are living there slash patients, um, I, I'm sorry, you know, I, I'm sure you said they are patients uh, that will be, they'll be smoking the marijuana for medical purposes, and in turn, they're going to be, their ability is going to be impaired and their function definitely won't be at 100%, but yet I'm to feel confident that they're going to be monitoring the security systems and yet an elephant could walk in there and take half the barn. Like I, I don't, I just don't feel confident with them statements in there and what they're saying. Uh, why, why do you have the residents slash patients monitoring the security system like uh, it's it's not an adequate security system of a uh, person has to sit in that residence and monitor it. It should be going back to a monitor station, specifically a police station that's that's there, not not to the home itself. I, I don't think that's right. And I, I guess the second one, no, not quite my last one, but second last uh, would be on page two fifteen or no. Sorry, I lied. 216. 225. Sorry. I got so many pages here. It's 225. And it's the letter from the lawyer. And it was dated January 8th, 2018. Um, he, he says in here please note that what is being proposed is personal growing. It's not commercial growing, not the big companies growing marijuana, packaging marijuana, mail marijuana, the hundreds and thousands of customers, and he goes on. And it says that 
This is not a company. This is four patients. They are friends. Uh, he is permitting them to recite and grow their marijuana at this property for the modest rent because he wants to help them. Uh, we believe our proposal, proposed rules for this grow and responsibly address the concerns raised by the Township of West Lincoln. Uh, I'm sorry, I know you're a lawyer, not disrespectful to you, but how could you say that? If it's not a business, what is it? I, I, I don't know how you could say that statement. And if he has a concern and he wants to help these friends, four people, he's got deep pockets because this is one expensive handout. He would be a lot further off to go and buy it for them personally and just give it to them is my personal thoughts. But that was your comments, and I, I vigorously disagree with them. So, uh, and, and I have one last ask. Uh, it'd be on page 211. Um, <coughs> under the comments, and it talks about common uh, medical marijuana production facility greenhouse produces a crop and is therefore an agricultural use permitted in the prime agricultural area. While <clears throat> WLZB has a provision for medical marijuana production facilities, they are not specifically listed as a permitted use in any agriculture or employment zone. A zoning bylaw amendment is required to permit the proposed medical marijuana production facility greenhouse on the subject property. And I know it's not tonight, but at the appropriate time, I, I look around the horseshoe and I ask my fellow counselors to deny this application. So that's all I got to say. Thank you. I do believe that your fellow counselors wish to ask a number of questions. So, Councillor Bell, thank you. And I believe, you. Councillor Bilsma, you've been given the floor. Thank you. I don't uh, disagree with anything my previous uh, counselor. Uh, colleague asked, uh, but I only have three three areas of concern that I raise in addition to to the ones that he raised, and the first is uh, the lines of accountability. Now um, I can appreciate that um, Mr. Gao has representation here, legal representation. Um, uh, normally, you have um, uh, a planner or a planner consultant who basically negotiates the. Uh, the wherewithal of planning law, the planning act, um, as a as a as legal representative, does that make uh, your company or your firm um, accountable? So that my question through you is to the lawyer: Does that make you accountable? So, for example, if there are after everything has been addressed and and there are uh, noted uh, non-compliant in terms of uh, smell or or number, is that uh, reflect to to your to your firm are you then therefore on the hook or is our are, 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 is our municipality to go to you then to get these issues resolved so are you will you have an ongoing relationship with this owner and and the and the uh, organization whatever that is whether it's a farm or an industry small industry um, so that's my question at this time Uh, well, right now, I, I'm just here to speak on his behalf. Uh, I mean, there is a great desire to try and address the concerns raised, and I, I, I need to seek further instructions is the short answer. Uh, if there was a way to make this happen, uh, we'd be open to anything, but I, I, I don't have those instructions at this okay. time. Okay. All right. So you're not accountable at this time, but possibly. Um, the, the second uh, question that I have is, is there... Uh, w with regards to the smell, if the smell does get out, uh, Pelham, is, it's been noted that the smell is getting out. Um, I've heard all kinds of ideas about it does have a charcoal filter system, it doesn't have a charcoal filter system, this, that, and the other thing. So I'm not going to conjecture if something's going wrong. But should smell escape, is smell a health hazard? Is, is there something, is, is there someone in the room who can answer whether or not 
actual smell is an allergen or is a health concern? Can you get high from the smell? I know my, my dad thinks you can get high from the smell, you know, but he's just my dad. Is there an expert that can tell me that, that, you, that if the smell escapes and the neighbors are smelling this, their children are smelling this, that somehow are they 100% safe, 99% safe, or not safe at all? Well, Councillor Billsma, I would say that we can ask the proponents but since none of them are medical doctors yeah. or doctors of, of development of a child's brain, which is one of the issues, uh, I, I, I don't know how credible we can put the information. They might have to seek it, so your question yeah. might have to come back. Well, that's but, so I'm, I'm putting the question out there, and if I can get that answer before um, or 11. included into a the eventual, perhaps, uh, recommendation report from staff, that would be a, a concern. Or a further so. public meeting, whatever it is. But I, I would caution Mr. Lewin that we're looking for evidential information Correct. about yeah. odors for an I, I wasn't community. directing it to him specifically. I just, I'm throwing that out there. That's an answer that I would like to have uh, or he question like that I would team, like to answer. He looked like the team lead. Yep. Okay. And so uh, I would like that one, that one answered because I, I, I think in, the, in that sense, it really flavors our ability to approve this or, because we have, we're charged with respecting the health of our uh, citizens at some level, at the municipal level. And then um, my last concern has to do with credibility. Uh, and when the application came previously and, and the, the four licenses of the patients were included, um, the, it was uh, written in there, the doctor that signed off on the um, uh, signed the application uh, to go forward to Health Canada. So there has to be a doctor that signs off. So a quick Google search of that doctor uh, provided information online that the doctor was a doctor specializing in cosmetic uh, surgeries. Uh, there was... Um, services. Yeah, um, services. There was, Botox was listed in the, in the website and, 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 and certain other things. My... My question is, um, is that, like he's not a rheumatologist. And, and, and uh, look, I, I have a very close friend. She's an elderly lady, um, a sweet and dear to the family, and she has arthritis, and she's been permitted to um, uh, use marijuana to help alleviate pain and, and joint discomfort. I get that. Did you say joint discomfort? Joint yeah. discomfort. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Just Part, that pun was completely unintended. Pun. Um, so, um, <laughs> uh, I, I guess, can is it totally legitimate that a cosmetic surgeon is able to issue these licenses? So, I, I want to I want to answer whether that is a legitimate uh, course to. Um, in the application, is the application already disqualified under that? Like, uh, so, I, I that's my question. If that research could be done, and we could check that out, because I think it's very important that we have a credible application, and I find that that part to be uh, somewhat suspect. So that's my other question. If the research could be done on the uh, on those, I know at this time those applications, and I noted that last time that they were going to expire soon, and they have since expired. So they're without. An application at this time so it becomes a moot point today but if this is approved then those applications will come back and so I, I still want to know that information that's those are my uh, two questions that are kind of floating out there thanks at this time so there's a number of questions that need to get answered mr. Lewin I saw you stand up did you want to try to address some of these uh, well, I can certainly address the last question certainly sir um, so uh, Health Canada requires that a medical practitioner sign, so there's no particular specialty requirement as long as they're, they're a doctor licensed by the College of Physicians and Surgeons. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Councillor Ganean. Uh, oh, Councillor Bilsma. I am done. Thank okay. You. So time. the other questions still remain un unanswered, yeah. and we'll leave that till the recap at the end of today's meeting about the unanswered questions. Councillor Ganean will pass the torch to you. Your, uh, your questions can be put. Thank you.
uh, and through you, Madam Chair. Um, I originally had a question um, for you, Mr. Lewin, and I'll just read it the way it is, but you've already addressed it. I see that the licenses that were presented as part of the report at the public meeting on November 13th, 2017, have now expired. And I asked the question, has Mr. Gao or have you on his behalf applied for new licenses? But you did address that, and thank you for doing that. However, before there's any reapplication for personal growing registrations, I have some comments that I'd like to make about that. So further to what Councillor Bilsma has said about looking at those licenses all being issued by the same doctor, I had some concerns as well about the license applications as my research regarding the numbers attached to daily levels of prescribed dried marijuana differ a great deal from what was on those now expired licenses, which indicated an amount of 50 grams per day. When this application first came forward, I personally had no knowledge of what an average daily dose of medical marijuana would be, and I'm sure nobody around this horseshoe did either. And so I contacted a local doctor associated with the Smithville Family Health Team to seek advice and was clearly and politely informed that they do not prescribe medical marijuana at all. And therefore, that doctor referred me to Health Canada online information and the document prepared by the College of Family Physicians of Canada, which was designed to provide guidance and assistance to physicians on this topic. So I'm now aware of several things. One, and I, I have my, my research that I've been doing for the last little while. So Health Canada, in their various guidelines, and in the recommendation 14 of the College of Physicians and Surgeons report, in regard to guidelines for prescribing medical cannabis to patients, both clearly state and restate the mantra, start low and go slow, in regard to daily dosage. Information on Growing Legally, a licensed legal medical marijuana site, states that Health Canada allows every patient to consume a maximum of five grams of medical marijuana every day. An article from Herb, a pro-medical marijuana site, entitled Five Helpful Tips for Getting the Correct Dose of Medical Cannabis, indicates that although many people start at just 0.25 grams, that is to say a quarter of a gram per day, many increase over time to somewhere between one and three grams daily, depending on the severity of their need and how their body metabolizes the cannabis. Canamed, another legally licensed medical marijuana producer, has also stated the one important recommendation to follow Start low and go slow in their literature. They indicate that several surveys have shown that the average daily dose of medical marijuana is one to three grams per day. A peer-reviewed study in the Netherlands published in medical journals by Hazenkamp and Heerdink in 2013, tracking information from 2003 to 2010 in a population of over 50,000 Dutch patients using cannabis for medical purposes, indicated that the average daily dose of dried cannabis of various potencies was 0.68 to 0.82 grams per day. A similar study done in Israel in 2011-2012 indicated that the average dose was 1.5 grams per day. Again, from the Health Canada website, information obtained from a limited number of small and short-term clinical studies of cannabis for medical purposes indicate the daily doses of smoked or vaporized dried cannabis range from as little as 75 milligrams of dried cannabis per day to a maximum of 3.2 grams of dried cannabis. Health Canada also reported various surveys published in peer-reviewed scientific and medical literature have suggested that the majority of people using smoked or orally ingested cannabis for medical purposes reported using between 10 and 20 grams of cannabis per week or approximately 1 to 3 grams of dried cannabis per day. And again from Health Canada, another study suggested that regardless of the route of administration, inhalation or oral, individuals reporting using cannabis for medical purposes reported consuming an average of around 3 grams per day. For smoking and vaporizing, the median reported dose was 1.5 to 2 grams per day, respectively. For edibles, the median reported was 1.5 grams per day. For teas, the median reported dose was 1.5 grams per day. And finally, and most powerfully for me, the federal government announced in a Globe and Mail article of April 2017 a new policy which limits veterans to three grams of medical marijuana instead of 10 grams over concerns about the small number of doctors writing those prescriptions. Vic Neufeld, the president and CEO of AFRIA, a licensed producer that serves about 650 veterans, thought that the three gram limit was out of line, stating that several veterans <clears throat> that have conditions, pardon me, that are much more serious than those of an average medical marijuana patient reported some using 3 grams, some using 4.6, some using 4.7 grams per day. And of that total number, that 650 that he looks after, fewer than 50 of those veterans would have prescriptions for 10 grams per day. 
So I've provided all of this information with all those varying numbers only to raise the point of question as to just why those original four licenses indicate a daily amount of 50 grams per day for use by the one person named on each license. When that number, 50 grams per day, is more than 15 times the daily amount according to Health Canada statistics. And even worse than that, it's five times more than the amount needed daily by our most severely ill, injured, or PTSD suffering Canadian veterans. My research also has produced the astounding information that a half gram is the most common amount of dried marijuana found in a pre-roll joint. So 50 grams per day would be the equivalent to 100 joints per day, which in turn would be the equivalent of approximately 3,000 joints per month, none of which would make any sense for personal use. Multiply that 3,000 joints times the four licenses at 1374 Port Davidson Road, and you're looking at the equivalent of 12,000 marijuana joints per month for only four sick people. I'm sorry, but this does not make sense. It makes me wonder if perhaps there was some type of mistake made on the original license application, <coughs> and that, I would suggest, needs some serious attention before reapplication. Thank you. Sir, you might want to address what the new licenses will be asked for. Uh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. You, the last question that Councillor Ganan leaves on the table is, what will the new licenses ask for? 50 grams again per day or more? Uh, well, I, it just uh, briefly about the numbers, I, uh, there's a big difference between the smoking and or vaporizing and consuming it, either consu just eating an oil, either in capsules or putting it into edibles. And I know you did make mention, mention of oral. Uh, it's uh, the process of cooking with it. You don't just throw it into the food. You extract the cannabinoids out of the plant matter. So you take a lot of cannabis and then you end up with a small amount of extracts is, or derivatives from it. And so, and I believe that the ratio that Health Canada uses in their regulations is 10 to 1 of uh, plant matter to extract that you get at the end. And I believe that's actually in the ACMPR regulations. So uh, it's my understanding edibles are being consumed. They're, yeah, they're not smoking joints all day, but they're consuming extracts. Um, but through the regulation still says 50 grams of dried marijuana per day. And it tells you that you need to take that into consideration. That's, that's the amount on, on, on the, their on information, the right? right. The, what they have. And so that then has to be put into, it doesn't mean you can have more to equal 50 grams. It means that 50 grams that you're allowed to do of dried marijuana, if I'm not mistaken, means that that's what you have to use. And that still is far in excess. I mean, they're not talking about, in all of the research that's been done, they are not talking about, you know, people just, I mean, you've probably read every document that I've read as well, but they are not talking about just people smoking a joint. I put that in because that number is so ridiculous that, that certainly it's more than any of the rest of us would have expected to hear. It's probably more than what you expected to hear. Just simply we don't think in terms of those very large numbers. 50 grams translates to much, much more than what it sounds like it does. They, they, they gross up, though. Health Canada contemplates grossing up when it's being, uh, when you're extracting the cannabinoids from the plant. So, which means you're going to have a small amount of um, oil that you'd either consume in a capsule or use in food. So, that's, so the numbers, if you're eating it, will be larger than if you're smoking it. So, are you then suggesting that they're going to be producing capsules? on the facility? Um, well, they would take, as is permitted by Health Canada, they would uh, remove the extracts, the can take the cannabinoids out of the dried marijuana. Um, so uh, that can be done safely. That's, there's no added license required for that. Um, so I'd like to ask also, have you been to the property, sir? I have not. Do you know that it's not just a residential property? Do you know that we're talking about a very large piece of property? Yes, yes. And that doesn't surprise you that, that your clients would be asking for that size property? I mean, I have another question. I can go on with that. But you've referred to it in your information as a medical marijuana garden. I think Mr. Rivers is more correct when he talks about it as a production facility. It is certainly not going to be a medical marijuana garden in the standards of, of what the government is looking at. The government is looking at, at helping people. I agree fully with what they've suggested. I think that if you have a sick person and... and and that person wants to grow five plants to 15 plants, that one to three for themselves. I think that, that that's something that's personally their decision, and I don't have fault with that. But this 
is, is magnified in excess. We're now looking at, you know, over 2 million square feet of property that you're calling a medical marijuana facility. Great. If you take those, those 20.9 hectares and you multiply that by the number of square feet in a hectare, you are talking about over 2,250,000 square feet of property. That's your medical marijuana garden. Well, we've, as we've mentioned, we, we've made it spread out so we avoid issues such as... Over oh, 2 million square feet, that's really spread out. That, I'm sorry. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you for your response. <coughs> Councillor Ganeen, uh, does that complete your uh, questions at the moment? I'll come back. Thank there's, you. There's opportunity again, of course. Mr. Mayor, did you want to go next or are you, uh, were you ready? Because I know that your other two colleagues' hands were up on that side. I'd like to commend my three colleagues over there. They've really done their homework, and they've done a great job, and um, I'm impressed. Um, I would just like to say this. It, at a time when you have four licenses, or as uh, Mr. Levin says, personal grower registrations, um, I would like to think that you need those four personal grow registrations in order to, in order to grow the, the cannabis, the medical marijuana that you need for your personal illness. And I find it very hard that they're not going to apply for their four licenses until they find out that the planning procedure goes through here in West Lincoln. So if, if I needed the personal grow registration, I would find the medical marijuana some way, somehow. But they're not, they're, they, they're not going to do that. They're just going to wait until this planning process goes through. So I just kind of find that odd. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Trombetta? Oh, sorry, did you want to address that? If I may briefly. We're being intuitive here, sure. I, I'll keep it super brief, but that, that's a, a good point. The, the process when you apply, so the doctor signs, you send it off, it takes on average about three to four months to get your license, but the clock starts ticking on the, mo the day the doctor signs, and you have to apply. So, um, so you it, might get nine months worth of growing. Uh, or, yeah, um, and so if they wait until they actually get it and they get it three to four months into it and then we initiate the process, at some, that, this process will take a couple of months. It's not instantaneous. And then to initiate your plants is going to take a few months. So they, if they did it that way, they'd really at the end of the 12 months be just <laughs> beginning. So there is a, a practical reason. Another question, Mr. Mayor. Um, another question. Um, so then what do they do in the meantime then? So I totally get that. I understand that. But so what do they do in the meantime? I, I don't know. I, I can't answer that. I can't answer. I, I just don't have the answer. I haven't inquired. Uh, That's fair. Thank you. Councillor Trombetta, did you wish to ask any questions at this time? And please don't feel put apart. Yes. Madam Chair, thank you. I won't be as technical as my colleagues on the other end of the horseshoe over there. They've done a lot of work there. I'm just going to get straight to the point. I've been sitting here in my first term of council, and we've had multiple applications come forward. This is one of the first applications that came forward that is so backwards and so unorganized I've ever seen come to this council since I've been in term. We had a guy come here from this representative that was selling or building the greenhouse. We had somebody come here who was a consultant, who didn't have any answers, who quit on the spot. Now we have a lawyer here today and an HVAC guy. We have no owner rep owners that's been here to talk to us. We've had no owner that went to approach any of the residents that are living near this facility or proposed facility. There's all these protections in place for the owner. What are the protections in place for the residents around this facility? It's, it's backwards. And it, quite frankly, it's quite annoying. Um, I'm not going to be as technical and get into all these kind of things. And my, my colleagues across the, the horseshoe did a good job on it. The, the, the residents aren't protected in this. The government is throwing this down our throats. I'm not in favor of this. They threw other things down our throats in, in this ward, in this community. This is ridiculous. It's a waste of my time. I'm not in favor of it. In, in favor of it. And I, this is just the most backwards application that has came forward to me in this term of council. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Trombetta. And Councillor Rayner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I believe this first started 
Uh, as Councilor Trombetta said, first there was an HVAC guy here, and then a you know, greenhouse gentleman, and then from there we had a planner. And when I drilled him about the fact that was he aware that there was an illegal grow up operation, he basically said I quit. Uh, so, I mean, it just went from one stage to the next. They mentioned, I believe, 69 plants in each of these small little greenhouses times 15. Is that not correct? 967 in total is what the report says. Yeah, but is, did they I not think. say 69 plants in 15? 69 in each greenhouse. Yeah, well, 69 times 15 is 1,035. I don't understand how they get 976 unless they added HST to their number. I have no idea. That may be for death. But I don't know. Did you want to answer that, there, there, Mr. There's Lewin? A, there's a, some weird things about this. Uh, there was a lot of excellent questions asked by uh, the counselors on the other side. I'm very impressed with the in-depth that they've gone into on this. It does look rather ridiculous that you've got a massive growing operation for four critically, supposedly critically ill people. That normally critical ill means that a long-term investment in a very expensive project on a massive scale will not get completed before the majority of them are not there to use the, use the facility. This sounds rather ridiculous. And the other thing, of course, is uh, why, if these gentlemen is from Brampton, did they have to go all the way to West Lincoln to do this if it's so important to their friends and they want to make sure they're looked after? I would make sure it was close to home so that I could look after it better. And the practice in the past, based on the flea bane and everything else that's grown on this total mess, is they don't look after it. And there's no doubt in my mind that they probably won't look after it in the future. The other thing is the hoop greenhouses to me is kind of a hokey kind of a greenhouse. It's plastic cover. It's susceptible to windstorms. Uh, it's the cheapest greenhouse you can build. And I, I very much question in the heat of the summertime uh, how they're going to vent it in order to control the temperature without really opening the thing up. And in which case their, their charcoal filter system is going to be uh, over capacity. It's not going to be able to handle it. There are so many things about this that it's it's just ridiculous, and as Councillor Trombetta said, it's chewed up an awful lot of our time. And the bottom line is, somebody <coughs> owns this property that's uncomfortable with having it close to home, and it's nice to dump it far away in some agricultural community and let somebody else worry about it. Well, I personally am not about to accept that, and I'll do everything I can to try to <coughs> stop this, because this whole thing to me is wrong. Um, if they're so much in love with the process, then those critically ill people should really, it would probably be easier and faster and more consistent to buy the product they need, especially when Councillor Ganand really gives the reality check on what they really need, um, than to go through all this effort, all this expense to help four of his friends, when by the time he's got it done, he may only have one of them left. So this this whole thing just doesn't add up. It's It's ridiculous and it's tied up a lot of our time and, and my feeling is, thank you very much, but please, uh, whatever you want to do, do it in Brampton or somewhere close to home because... It's Markham, sir. ...where whatever. It's certainly not near this agriculture community. West Lincoln is an agriculture community, and we're proud of what we grow here, but we grow stuff that's of a different nature, and it supplies food to people, and uh, it's, it's not anything regarding this kind of stuff that Health Canada all of a sudden thinks that there's, there's a need for it. So anyways, that's all I've got to say on the subject, and I will not support this in any way, shape, or form, no matter what they bring to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Super brief. I just a clarification on the number, that's all. Yeah. Uh, this, the 69 would be, I believe, based on 14 buildings. There would be one for a couple of mother plants mother that have plants. to be kept separate from the others. Right. So before we go any further, um, from a planning perspective, and I'm going to take some time to put my points on the table, and that is that, you know, planning planners worry about complete communities and established communities and destabilization of, of existing communities. And while this isn't an urban intensified area where you would worry about putting in a fire hall or taking out a school, destabilizing a country, a, a small rural area, a community such as ours, would say that we now, because there are not the distance separation requirements and crop restrictions on various things, I wonder what the impacts of that is. And I wonder how I'm to get those answers tonight, given that I don't have 
experts in growing, but I have I have an expert in editing magazines, and I don't mean to diminish, to, to diminish the the uh, credentials of any of the experts here this evening, but I'm struggling with no planner and no agricultural specialist who can answer it. Maybe I'm I'm underestimating or overestimating what it is I'm looking for, but that destabilization of our community and the implications of health impl uh, that, uh, that my colleagues have done about. Uh, the health of growing children and or other people if they were to uh, have to face this kind of odors or whatever concern me. I, I don't understand how now we're putting the off, I, I, I guess for me there is so much information that has changed that I'm not sure what to expect from this facility. Last time I think we were told that there would be lie put on to, not lies, but lie thrown on the cannabis remains such that they would then be, uh, uh, they would, they would be um, decomposing s more quickly. That troubled us because in fact the lie would get into the groundwater and get into the earth, etc. Now I'm being told that it's going to go to a, to a landfill site mixed with, uh, with uh, cat litter. And um, I, I need to understand what it is. And I guess uh, part of that is my confusion, or I'm, I'm not confused, I'm, I'm just skeptical about the planning justifications in this report because I'm being told it's a garden and I don't have a definition of a garden. I'm being told it's a garden but in fact the planner that wrote the planning justification report calls it a production facility. So. If the planner, who's supposed to understand the planning aspects of this application, calls it a production facility, and elements of the facility are going to come under the industrial building code requirements, I'm really wondering what my garden at home is going to do with my shovel and my hoe in my hand as I do a garden, which is my understanding of a garden. So I'm looking for some definitions about how we put this together and from the people who would normally give us those kinds of definitions. I appreciate the fact that you are here, Mr. Lewin, with your experts. And Mr. Lewin, if you wouldn't mind, I'd just like to ask, what, law, what type of law do you actually practice? Your specialty is? I, I'm a cannabis lawyer, is what I, I am, really. Is that what you've been all your life? Uh, no, no, I was, um, I, I was a criminal lawyer for many yes, years, yes. and then I, I did, I developed sort of a focus on cannabis law, and that's kind of morphed over time and people come to me for various cannabis-related issues. So okay, thank I, you. I, no, I just wondered. I, I just thought I should ask that question. Thank you. Um, I, I worry about the fact that we're storing a cannabis given that we're giving, we're being told. And I guess really I need to understand the size because I don't take away from anybody the right to have cannabis for their, for their own consumption, but there's a troubling part of, of this in that the planning talks about the size. They talk about reduced setbacks so that they could in fact use this. They've got, how much Mrs. Uh, Councillor Ganan? How many acres? Well, we're not sure because there was a couple of numbers. Well, there were those, but there was also some disconnect on some of the feet. But on that entire site, I'm wondering why you need all these setback restrictions and, and yet, and you want all of this cannabis in storage, yet in fact they're supposed to be sufficient to be able to, to use it on a daily basis. So if there is a processing requirement, which is part of the planning application, why would you need all this storage? Because in fact they're supposed to be using all of this stuff per day. So in a planning justification report, wouldn't you be building something that would support what it is you're going to use? Because that relates into what the public sees as how much you're growing and what else can we expect? Is this the door cracked open because something doesn't add up? Um, we are we are being told that you're going to have cameras. We're being told that the four people who are going to be operating this facility are in fact unwell. How unwell I don't know, but mm, I can tell you, helping in one greenhouse in a perfectly healthy way, I cannot find enough hours in the day, although I do work full time, uh, to to feel good in one greenhouse. So I'm struggling with exactly how much this oversized facility. And that's one of the questions in this whole thing. Are we oversizing for a reason or is there something that we're not being told? Because there are so many 
uh, errors or, or differences of comment in the reports. Um, we're being told to change filters, and that would solve our problems on exhaust fumes. Um, we're being told that the motors are being oversized double to create the negative pressure in these houses. It leads one to believe all this wonderful investment, as one of my colleagues has already said, is why would you need all this investment before you could go out and buy it cheaper? But that's the question that isn't really answered. It's not really the planning justification that we're looking for, but it's the understanding as good neighbors that Mr. Lewin has pointed to, good neighbors that are going to take care of the grass and going to make sure that the weeds don't go up and are going to make sure that no one is hurt and going to make sure that it's there, that, that there's no one feeling uncomfortable. Yet tonight, the questions I want to ask do not have the experts here to answer those for me. Tonight, the lack of knowledge, technical knowledge, worries me. Tonight, the lack of explanation as to the oversizing for this worries me. Tonight, the fact that we are not sure that we have a grower growing the product as defined in the Act, or are we having four people grow their own? And if so, come prepared to answer where they're going to live, if they're going to live there, and be prepared when you're coming forward with an application for this property to also ask for a multi-residential facility or explain the familial relationship that we don't have answers to tonight because that is part of what's going on because the land use of this property is not just about cannabis. It is about changing the land use. And I, poor people who were here a minute ago with their brand new baby was trying to put a trailer so they could put one house on. So we gave them just a hearty a rebut to their request as we are here for you. Give us all the answers and have the right people here to answer my questions and those of my colleagues. And I apologize if I'm going on, but Councillor Bilsma will tell me when I've gone on too long. Um, um, that was not a, that, we'll talk about it later. Um, I've heard about lights for a greenhouse, I've heard about venting, I've heard about no venting, I've heard about the, the greenhouses are going to be there, the lights and the, and the board fence are going to be, are going to be our preventative to, to, uh, to, uh, having, um, interference with people in the general area. Uh, I can tell you right now that from my home, and that's quite a ways away from Rosa Flora, the lights glow in, in the evening, in the twilight and night. So if this is going to be uh, there, tell me what preventative natures on the focusing of those lights and the number of hours they're going to run. Because again, tonight I couldn't get that. My colleagues could not get that answer. Um, so we, we commend people who must have cannabis to using it to, 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 to reduce their pain. But we're looking for ensuring that this is 100% a legal crop in a legal building that does not destroy an established community, does not destabilize anyone. And um, hold on. I apologize. I was more put together, but I don't want to reiterate what my colleagues have said. It would be it would be good, and I will say this again for the record. Uh, I, I need the planner here, and I need your experts on agriculture to be able to ask the questions we want to ask. This is a public meeting where we're supposed to ask those questions. My opinion on you on your application shouldn't be here, but should be at the time we address your final re recommendation report, sir. But it will be there that I expect to have the answers that are missing tonight. And, and uh, just because the law says that a doctor can recommend these kinds of things, I think we need the answers to the other things, the, the implications to the people around the area, the, the, the amount of loss there is in drying weight and, and, and oils, and how those oils, which I understand are the size of a piece of rice, will not be consumed on a daily basis because stockpiling, stockpiling 
is not what I think we're doing. Yet we have a safe and we're growing far more than anyone needs in a day. And that question wasn't answered by Councillor Ganan's question. So for me, there are too many questions that I won't bother to ask because the, the right people aren't here. To me, I, I, I wonder why we've had so many meetings to Councillor Rayner's point, we've wasted a lot of time here trying to get to the answers, and yet here we are with a third public meeting and not yet the answers that we need to be able to make the planning decision and the why you want the setback and the consistency of answers that gets us to what it really is that's being asked for here. So um, I believe normally when there's a public meeting that all sides get together, you try and real, uh, eliminate the problems and come forward with a comprehensive uh, application. Um, no planner, no planning lawyer, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. So with that, I'm going to say I, too, would love to ask my que more questions, but I won't bother this evening. And to that end, s unless we see anyone here around the table where we can find it, and Councillor Bell, if, Bell, if you wish to ask another question, I apologize if I cut you off before you had your full. So I'm done. I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll allow any members of council to have another opportunity to speak, and I apologize if as chair I spoke before I allowed that. So Councillor Bell was first, and then Mayor Joyner. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, well, you can answer it, Mr. Treble can answer it, but you touched on it. This is a third public meeting, and I... And site plan has to happen after that. Yeah, well... I guess what I'm suggesting, because the first one was a total waste of time, second wasn't much behind it, this one tonight was very unproductive, and I guess what I'm suggesting is why would we entertain this application any further than 10 o'clock tonight? Uh, I, I don't see a reason why we're going any further with it. They keep coming back. We're not getting answers. That's why we have public meetings. and. I'm suggesting that we do not entertain this any further tonight. Is there a reason why we have to entertain this any further? I'll go to We've been more than fair. I I'll go to count Mr. Treble where I believe he'll have the appropriate answer and then I'm going to my other colleagues here at the other side of the table. Through you, Madam Chair, uh, I know there's a lot of technical type questions that, that have been raised that uh, deserve answers that haven't been answered. but. From a land use planning perspective, I think I've heard enough from the public and from the concerns of council and, uh, and whatnot that I'm not convinced that we need to have further public deliberations. Um, it'd be my thought that, that staff will seek some clarification from the applicant. Uh, that will come in the form of a recommendation report and uh, the applicant, the public, everyone will have another chance to deliberate it at that time. And, and go from there. I'm not sure there's much more to be garnered tonight uh, either. So I'm, I'm certainly supportive of the fact that we move on to a recommendation report at a future planning committee meeting and, and go from there. I believe that the director has already said that's what his plan is. So it, he's, we can do that when we get to the application. Count, uh, Mayor Joyner and then Councillor Rainer. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I kind of had the same sort of question, too, as well, and thoughts about the, the whole process going forward. But I do remember um, that not too long ago there was a technical report, and I've heard some people, and there's a lot of passion around the table tonight, saying, you know, we're not voting for this. Well, I just want to remind Council, and I look some, for some clarification from the acting CAO, and perhaps Mr. Treble on this point, if we do not vote for this, regardless of what we vote for this, this is still going to go to a recommendation report. But if we turn this down, then it doesn't go to a recommendation report and it puts us on a whole new different a whole that, new different process or that's right. deliberation. And so, that's further in the agenda when we deal with the issue that we yes. would do those things. And I just wanted to bring that up. Yes. That's all. Yes. yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Rayner. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor brought up a good point, and, and we know the technical report has to go forward if we want this to proceed. It's just that there's a lot of questions here that you would think you'd want to stop the process, but really you've got to let it continue and run its course. And, and I appreciate that. Um, the, the residents uh, obviously had concerns about smell, and I'd like to relate an incident uh, of just uh, a few months ago, and uh, 
This is very strange. I can understand how they would appreciate the smell is so bad. I I, uh, I went to Brantford up Highway 2 to Jeff's At Work Furniture, and there was a pungent uh, marijuana smell in the air. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. It's almost right in the city, and it was quite strong. And when I finished in there, I went to the TSC, which was about half a kilometer down, if not a little farther, and it was just as strong down there. So I can appreciate what the people living in that area would be concerned about, because it's very pungent. It really, you really definitely find it irritating for one who doesn't indulge in that stuff, and it carries a long way. Um, so this is this is a very serious thing, especially when it's 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 a uh, a hooped greenhouse arrangement, which I don't have a lot of confidence that it's airtight, and especially that it's weather tight uh, for storms that we have and stuff. And uh, this stuff gets out; it carries a long way. And uh, I can understand the importance of of making sure that this is done right. I appreciate what what the chairman has said with regards to her concerns. Um, trying to look at it from the perspective of everything needs to be checked over and, and to make sure it's correct. But it's also just a point if it's just something that really is desirable in this area, are we going to get into a something that's going to make it difficult and require a lot of bylaw enforcement, which takes time, which is frustrating, which is aggravating. And, uh, you know, and if the bylaw officers are not available during the day, is it something the police can do? And yet, we had a situation where we had an illegal grow up there and the police did nothing. So if it's an illegal grow up and they've done nothing, and then we go through the process and everybody agrees that they're going to be very good and conscientious and good citizens and, and respect the land and find out that that's not the truth, then we've got a nightmare to enforce it. So, And the track record on this property is not giving me the confidence to say, they're really, they're really conscientious and respect agriculture, and we've got nothing to worry about. It's exactly the opposite. So they haven't helped themselves in the process they got to now, and it just makes it much more uncomfortable to move forward from there. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, Mr. Treble, you wanted to speak to this. And I do understand we're focusing on the land use and the appropriateness of the design and development, the size, the setbacks they're asking for, the compromises in our planning. So please if you want to remind us of that, but I think that's really where Council's going. There's a little bit of an embellishment and a concern about why, but go ahead. No, just through you, Madam Chair, just to, I guess, sort of follow through what, what I had said earlier. I think from, from my perspective, it's important that Council give staff the authority to write a recommendation report and carry through to a proper conclusion, which would mean Council making a decision that decision is then appealable by the neighbors or the applicant, depending on which way the, the chips may fall. But um, I think it's important that we finish the process suggesting that we not carry on beyond a tech report. I'm not sure is the right solution or the right way out. So I think that would be my advice anyway, that staff be authorized to prepare a recommendation report for a future meeting. So I'm going to ask that Council do that when we get to the item further on the agenda, because <clears throat> that would be the appropriate place for us to do that. So, oh, Councillor Bell, sorry, <clears throat> I was just going to call the meeting closed here. Yeah. No, just through you to Mr. Treble and the rest of the county, just so no misunderstanding, when I said not to drag this on, basically, was not meant that we close it. Yes, we have to vote. We have to allow the process to come to the recommendation. That's what was meant by it. Sorry, I wasn't clear, but that's no, what understand. the intent was, not to shut it down. So. Thank you for the clarification, Councillor Bell. We're, I'm seeing no other comments from my side of the table, Mr. Treble and your staff. No one wants to speak to this item anymore. So please be advised that this is a technical report that is being considered by Planning Committee this evening and that in future a recommendation report may be forthcoming to, a, to the planning and or council meetings. Please be advised that once planning committee and or council has made a decision with the zoning bylaw amendment and if approved by council, a notice of its passing will be circulated with an appeal period. <clears throat> Pardon me. There is an attendance sign-in sheet which is located on the table near the doors which we would ask all present to sign. Please ensure that when signing the attendance sheet for this evening's meeting, uh, you place a check mark in the column mark Shea Jor Gao. 
if you wish to be advised of any subsequent meetings and or decisions on this matter. And because of its importance, therefore, people who are interested in observing council and or committee discussions about a particular bylaw should not solely rely on mailed notices and thus miss the opportunity to attend meetings. It is suggested that you watch the Township's website for posting of agendas to review items that will be discussed at committee and or council. The agendas for meetings are posted on the Township website at 4 p.m. on the Friday prior to the meeting. Additionally, meeting schedules are also noted on the website for public review. If you wish to receive notices by email, it is suggested that you include your email address with your mailing address and your phone number on the attendance sign-up sheet. Thank you, and I declare this public meeting adjourned at 9.52. I do believe, I do believe that it would be a worthwhile opportunity to take a, a two-minute break. So we'll, again, recess the meeting. You know what?